All right, good evening, Catholics of Franklin and Westwood. Welcome back to our Lenten series. Um, I think I could start every one of these by saying now for something completely different because every week is going to be completely different. Um, thank you for all the, the great comments about last week, uh, making decisions. If you missed it, you just have to go to the registration page. I put a link to the video up there. Um, and sometime soon, this will be up there as well. If you have a friend who missed it. Um, although I will warn you, uh, this one's, you know, like I geeked out in the first one with a little bit of science. We're going to geek out a little bit with uh, theology or, uh, you know, study of scripture. Because this is this is all going to be about scripture. Um, this thing, where do I go? There it says the, the Bible books used only by Catholics. That's a little misleading because lots of other uh, Christian groups use them as well, just not the Protestant group. So we, the Greek Orthodox, uh, Eastern Catholics, uh, other groups do use these books as well. It's just the Protestants that do not. So we're going to um, let me share my screen and we'll get into this. There we go. All right. Excellent. Well, let's, I'm going to start with an opening prayer, which is simply the reading of Psalm 150, one of my favorite prayers. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Praise God in his holy sanctuary. Give praise in the mighty dome of heaven. Give praise for his mighty deeds. Praise him for his great majesty. Give praise with blasts upon the horn. Praise him with harp and lyre. Give praise with tambourines and dance. Praise him with strings and pipes. Give praise with crashing cymbals. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath give praise to the Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Whenever I'm feeling a little down, I read Psalm 150. You can't be feeling down after reading Psalm 150. So I wanted to start with scripture because tonight we're going to be talking all about scripture. And, and we're, we're not even going to bring up the New Testament. We're going to stay in the old stuff, the Old Testament, the stuff that the, the Jewish people gave us before Jesus even was born of Mary. So it's, um, so, um, but I'll try to, there have been some misunderstandings that I've encountered in my life. And so I put together this, I actually wrote an article, oh my gosh, seven years ago on this subject. Um, and um, uh, if I look back now, it was probably a very amateurish job because I've studied so much more about it since. Um, but uh, I found that there's a lot of people that just don't understand this particular issue. There's a common misunderstanding out there some people think that since the Catholic Old Testament contains seven more books than Protestant Bibles, the Catholic Church must have added them later to justify doctrines that Jesus did not teach. And nothing could be further from the truth. And I'm here to tell you tonight why that's so. And then after I do that, we're going to look at these seven books and just do a kind of a flyby on them. Uh, not get into too much too much detail on them, but just give you a taste of what's in them. These are the 46 books of the Old Testament. They fall into groups. The first group there in the upper left is called the Pentateuch, um, which is the, uh, the five uh, books of Torah, uh, which are the key books to the Jewish people, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, we'll refer back to those in, in just a moment. We also have the wisdom books, Psalms, which I just read to you from, uh, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Job, and then you got two that have lines under them, Wisdom and Sirach, and those are two of the books we're talking about. In fact, anything you see with a line under it is something we're going to talk about tonight. There are some history books, a lot of history books in the Old Testament. They start with Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, great area of, of the, the Judges period uh, in, in Old Testament history. 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, Kings, Chronicles. And then we, we kind of start to peter out there, Ezra, Nehemiah, and we get to Esther, and Esther has additions. And we're going to talk about that in just a couple of minutes. And then you've got a whole slew of these, Judith, Tobit, 1 Maccabees, 2 Maccabees, don't appear in Protestant Bibles. Um, why is that? We're going to talk. 
And then the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Baruch, uh, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Why are they major? They're not major because of importance. All the prophets are important. They're major because they're big. These are big books. These are longer, much longer books. The minor prophets, Hosea, uh, Joel, Amos, Abadiah, Jonah, et cetera, et cetera. These are uh, the minor prophets, not because they're less important, because they're smaller. These are much smaller books. So uh, that gives you a, a big, broad picture of what the Old Testament looks like. And now let's kind of, we'll do some vocabulary first, so we're all on the same page. Um, and then uh, we'll kind of dive into how, how did this mess all occur. Um, the first word I want to teach you is Septuagint. Um, perhaps some of you know that word, some of you don't. It is known as the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. So if you remember, you know, probably in, in our faith formation, we learned that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the New Testament was written in Greek. And that's for the most part true. Uh, we will see some differences to that tonight. But in general, that's true. Um, but at some point, the Greeks kind of like took over the area and they didn't really want to read something like this in Hebrew. So they wanted it converted into Greek, translated into Greek. So you'll see in my, in my bullet there, um, it says Greek translation of Hebrew scriptures, LXX. LXX, if you remember your uh, Roman numerals, is 70. Um, because the, as the story goes, it took 70 men um, quite a long time to translate all of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. And this happened around 200 BC. Uh, and so then we had something called the Septuagint. Um, so it's an entire Greek book, which included a Greek translation of the Hebrew. All 73 books that, that we have uh, it says we're translated into the Septuagint, but it should say 46 of the Old Testament. We add in the New Testament a little bit later on. Um, my faux pas there. Um, this was, uh, the whole 73 books, however, was then translated by St. Jerome in 400 AD. So this is 600 years later. He translated all 73 books into, into uh, Latin. And that is what we call the Vulgate. And this book, the Vulgate, has been used uh, by the Catholic Church since St. Jerome created it in 400 AD until not that many decades ago when we decided that it was time that we looked at the original Hebrew and the original Greek with a you know, little, little more attention than just relying on the Latin translation. So um, for basically, over 1500 years, the, uh, the Vulgate was the book of the Christian church. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. This was not, uh, we, we never really had an official canon until the Council of Trent, which was in 1546. There, uh, I'll, I'll talk about some exceptions to that, but that was the, the only time that the church has really given a big rubber stamp on these are the books of the Bible, period. End of story. Have a nice day. 73 of them, uh, 1546. Um, however, uh, we the church has been using canons of scripture for quite some time. The Catholic Bible contains uh, all the books that have been traditionally accepted by Christians uh, since the Synod of Rome in 382. Um, so that was that there was evidence that they uh, we have documentation from 382 from that synod that, uh, that there was a list of books that was put together for that. Um, and then Pope Innocent the first a few years after that, uh, in a letter to the Bishop of Toulouse, France, or what became France, is credited with compiling the first list of the current biblical canon. Now, there were some exceptions at that point. We had a few other books in there that kind of fell out of use. Um, um, but we, the oldest surviving list that we have, um, this is actually a picture of it. Uh, it's a reproduction, actually, of, of what is called the Muratorian Fragment. Uh, dates back to about the seventh or eighth century. Um, we don't get too much in the way of paper prior to that because it all disintegrates, um, but we do have this, 
and it is believed to contain a Latin translation from the Greek list dating back to 170 AD, as it makes a mention of Pope Pius I. So may or may not have been as old as 170, but certainly there was a, a collection of books that was used as early as, as 170, um, perhaps even sooner, um, that were very commonly used. Um, and uh, there might be a few minor differences along the way, but for the most part, um, that was the list. And now here's where the trouble starts to brew. Um, around the year 100 AD, in the city of what was then called Jamnia, uh, the city no longer exists. It's the closest city in Israel now to it is, is uh, Tel Aviv. Um, a conference of rabbis met and the rabbis wanted to decide which of these books belonged in the Jewish canon. And so they came up with some criteria uh, and the, the rabbis um, decided that there were four criteria that they wanted, that all books had to follow. Um, the first one was that they had to conform to the Pentateuch or the Torah. Um, in other words, it couldn't conflict with anything that, that was said in those five books. Those are the five biggies. So if there was anything in any book um, that had anything counter to, to what's written in Torah, uh, it should not be considered canonical uh, for the Jewish people. Um, they also decided it had to be written before the year 400 BC. We're going to see that this causes some difficulties because we've got a couple of books written after that. Um, it had to be written in Palestine and it had to be written in Hebrew. So this worked very well for the Jewish people. Excellent work for the Jewish people. Christian criteria for canonicity was a little more vague. Um, but also very powerful when you dive down into it. We look at antiquity. In other words, does this book have long-term use? Did it go back to the time of the apostles? Did Jesus read this book? Did the apostles read this book? Um, those are the kinds of, of things that we talk about when we say antiquity. Orthodoxy must conform to the Christian faith. I'm sure you've all heard about some of it, like the, uh, the Gospel of Judas and, and things like that. There are a number of other books that have never made it to the Bible. Why didn't they? This was the, the second bullet was a big killer of books. Um, a lot of them had, um, a, you know, like one of them has a Jesus that flies. Uh, and others had elements of what's called Gnosticism, which was a heresy. Uh, that was involved in it. So they, they, there were reasons why they never took off. Um, they weren't considered uh, to, to really be true to the faith. And then another very, very important aspect is the liturgical use. So we're looking at whether or not the Christian church has been using these in its liturgical setting. So did we use it at mass? Is this something that has been used um, you know, by, by Christians during the, the, the mass. Uh, and there are times that certain books were used by, let's say, very popular in Rome, um, but up in uh, Frankfurt <laughs> or, or whatever the cities were called back then up in, up in uh, somewhere up in Europe, uh, maybe they were using some different books. So as time evolved, certain books really became very popular um, and you start to see some consistent liturgical use. Um, the Catholic Church might add, well, because we said so, um, uh, because it all goes back to the Septuagint. So there were, we, we have 46 books in the, in the Old Testament. We, somebody converted those into Greek and then that whole mess got moved over into, into uh, Latin. Uh, to the Vulgate, and that's our book. So that's what we're going to use. So there is some element of that, but really these three bullets are, are how we look at um, canonicity for different books. Martin Luther. Martin Luther comes along. This is where everything really starts to, to fall apart for us. Martin Luther went and self-taught himself Hebrew and, and Greek. Um, he became quite the purist and believed that 
Uh, the Old Testament really needs to be written in Hebrew, and the New Testament really needs to be written in Greek. Well, the New Testament is written in Greek. There's there, Nobody argues that. Um, we're not here to talk about the New Testament tonight. So um, he decided at one point to use the Jamnia criteria, which he was well aware of, to isolate seven books and parts of two others into a section he called Apocrypha, which means obscure in Greek. Uh, and he placed it between the Old Testament and the New Testament in the German versions that he created. So he didn't throw them out of the book. He just isolated them because they didn't meet the Jamnia criteria. Uh, and he was a Hebrew purist and, and wanted and really believed that that is where God, God was speaking to the Hebrew people in Hebrew. And that's what we need. So it, it was written in it was in the Old Testament, it was written in Greek. Hmm, there's a problem here. Let's, it, it, it looks like it's going to be something good to read, but let's just put it in its own section. Um, so a few decades after the Protestant Reformation, the Council of Trent finally said, well, we're not falling for this Apocrypha thing. We said what the books were. Here are the books. We're declaring it. Boom, this goes down. That's it. And that started to, to separate these two groups. Martin Luther and his people are putting an apocrypha in and the, um, the Catholic church saying, nope, 73 books, that's it. So if we follow what happened now, now that Luther did this, and, and please remember Martin Luther died a Catholic priest. Martin Luther did not found the Lutheran church. Um, he, that church was started after his death. Um, so, um, it wasn't he that pulled these out. He died with these books still in the Bible. In fact, they stayed in the Bible for quite some time uh, after that. But he, he definitely created this apocryphal section, um, which started to cause some problems. The, the other big Protestant reformer was John Calvin out of Geneva. Um, and starting around 1630, volumes of the Geneva Bible were occasionally, not always, but occasionally bound with pages of the Apocrypha section excluded. Hmm. So it had all, it had, see, now we're up at 1630, and that's just when it started to be dropped out a little bit, and just a little bit. But 14 years later, English Parliament comes along and forbids the reading of the Apocrypha in Anglican churches. So now we've got, now we have some issues. Now it's going to break with tradition. We're not going to be reading it in mass anymore, uh, even the Anglican mass. Um, in 1666, the first editions of the King James Bible, which, uh, you know, credit where credit is due, King James is probably the most widely read English version of the Bible. Uh, it first was published in 1611, um, and it had the Apocrypha in it. Um, but the, in 1666, the first editions um, without the Apocrypha started to be bound. And if we dig into this a little bit more and go, okay, so who was making these decisions? Notice I say English Parliament, King James, publishing. There's no, even John Calvin didn't exactly pull out the Apocrypha. So who were these people that were doing this? Shockingly, this is when the printing press got invented. The invention of, the, of stereotype printing made it possible to produce Bibles in large print runs at very low costs. So there was some suddenly some competition to see who could sell Bibles uh, at, at, a, at a faster clip and make them cheaper and make more money. So in 1769, the decision was finally made to print the King James version of the Bible without the Apocrypha. It was less expensive. This move reduced the cost further, and there was some market appeal to the non-Anglican Protestant readers. Um, so certain other Protestant groups that had by that time, you know, formed over in uh, over in England, um, said, "Well, we didn't we didn't put the park on ours." So King James, well, okay, great, I'll buy the King James because it doesn't have that other section in it. You know, that started in, in 1769. Still nothing formal yet, but the printing press has come and ruined the Apocrypha for us. 
The British and Foreign Bible Society then withdrew subsidies for Bible printing and dissemination in 1826 under the following resolution, that the funds of the society be applied to the printing and circulation of the canonical books of scripture to the exclusion of those books and parts of books usually termed apocryphal. So just when you think that perhaps somebody with some theological background may have had something to do with this, no, it was the printing industry that decided to cut costs and that made things less familiar to people. And sooner or later, somebody said, well, I don't even know what's in those books. I haven't seen those in a while. Let's just print it without them. So these decisions got made to cut the the Apocrypha out of this. And if Martin Luther had just left it right where it was, none of these decisions probably would have occurred. So what books are we talking about here? Well, here, here's the seven books. Wisdom, which the Catholic Church typically refers to as the, uh, the Book of Wisdom. But if you look at the Vulgate version and say it, it translates to the Wisdom of Solomon, and, it, and Solomon is credited with that book, although it's highly unlikely that he, that he wrote it. Um, it was written in Greek, um, for one thing, uh, and uh, it dates to about 200 BC. Solomon was quite a bit older than that. Um, the next book, which I think, uh, if you want my personal and humble opinion, um, probably has the greatest chance of, of making its way out of the Apocrypha, um, is Sirach. Um, we, the book of Sirach is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, it, was, it was written um, after 516 BC, so there is a chance that it was before that 400 mark. Uh, most of the copies of, of Sirach that we have are in Greek. However, there is evidence to show that it had been originally written in Hebrew. Um, so there's a lot of question marks on the book of Sirach. And we're, we'll talk about Sirach in just a second. And now jumping to probably the least likely book um, to, to be retained in the Bible, the book of Judith. Um, uh, also, uh, it... it questionable as to what language it was originally written in. It was clearly written about 150 BC, making it one of the newest books of the, of the Old Testament. Um, it does appear in the Septuagint, but it's never been used in liturgy. Um, so there is, there's no track record here. We, if, if you've ever been to, to Mass and heard the book of Judith, you were in the wrong church because it doesn't appear. Uh, there's a, it's one of only two books in the Bible that, that do not appear, Obadiah being the other one, one of the minor prophets. Um, the book of Tor of Tobit um, was written in Hebrew, possibly in Aramaic, uh, around 200 BC. Um, it does have some conflict with Torah, which is one of the reasons it was ceremoniously tossed out by the, uh, by the uh, Jamnia group, the, the, the rabbis. Um, and it has something to do with the writing of wedding vows. There's a big focus on wedding in, in Tobit. Um, so yeah, that was a bit of a problem. Um, first Maccabees was definitely written in Hebrew around 200 BC, but all we have is the Greek that has survived, but there, there's clearly uh, archeological evidence, et cetera, et cetera, um, for um, that it was written in Hebrew. Second Maccabees is, one of the, is gonna be one of the more exciting topics that we, we tackle tonight because uh, there's a lot of Catholic theology in 2 Maccabees. It was clearly written in Greek. It is definitely the newest of the, of the books, um, competing with Judith for that. For that. Um, but there were some Jewish doctrinal issues, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about those a little bit when, I, when we get to this book of 2 Maccabees. And then finally, Baruch. Um, uh, some other question marks as to what language Baruch got written in, and um, there, there's a lot of questions about its origin and a lot of conflicts um, with it. Um, there's also some additions. Uh, these additions appear in Esther. There are six additional interspersed chapters. Uh, the book of Esther was written in Hebrew. However, these additional interspersed chapters were written in Greek. 
uh, and uh, this was done before 200 BC. It's all come over in the Septuagint, uh, as you can see for all of these, but it was, um, uh, and we'll talk when we get to Esther, I'll tell you, tell you why these, these phrases were in there, or these, uh, these additional chapters. And then there are three stories that have been injected into Daniel, the book of Daniel. Um, the, the first one is uh, what's called the Song of the Three Young Men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three guys thrown in the furnace um, and uh, dance around with God inside the furnace and, and remain unharmed. Um, there is the story of Susanna. Uh, in Daniel 13, and Bell and the Dragon in Daniel 14. These are uh, Greek stories that have been injected into a otherwise Hebrew um, um, Dan book of Daniel. So let's still talk just briefly about where the Catholics use these books. So this chart here is showing you what happens on Sundays. So if you go to church every Sunday, uh, what are you going to hear? Well, you're going to hear Sirach seven times over a, we use a three-year cycle uh, in, in, uh, on Sundays in the Catholic Church. Um, and so you're going to hear Sirach read to you seven times over that three-year period for a total of 43 verses. Wisdom, another seven times, uh, 42 verses. Baruch, just twice. And Second Maccabees, once. Um, so not a lot do we get on Sundays. However, we pile it in during the week. So uh, there's a two-year cycle for midweek readings. Uh, and Sirach, you're going to get 14 times for 130 verses. We do a lot of Sirach during the week um, compared to the rest of it here. Uh, Tobit comes in here for 74 verses. The Editions of Daniel, uh, eight times. Wisdom, Maccabees, um, Esther, we only use once. There's one little addition that gets used. Um, that, no, there's other Esther, but the additions uh, we get, uh, we have only want seven lines. And as I said before, Judith, you never hear. Um, I had to look up what the book was even about. <laughs> so, because we just don't hear it on, uh, in, in when we go to our Catholic church. And the Jews don't use the book, and the Protestants don't include it, so it's it's really out on the fringe, and it is a pretty dicey story. We'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. Um, so the first one I want to tackle is uh, Sirach. Sirach is actually named G Jesus, which fortunately we decided to use Sirach because that would have been really confusing. But it's Jesus, son of Eleazar, son of Sirach. Uh, it's a collection of ethical teachings. And by the way, I'm sending you all these slides. So this is a point where I'm going to read a little bit off the slides and I'm going to skip a bit, but you'll, you'll get these slides if this is something, if you haven't hung up already, because this is like way too intense of Old Testament stuff, um, then uh, you, you'll have all this to read. Um, it's uh, considered wisdom literature. Uh, it's in that wisdom category, as I showed you earlier, like wisdom, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Songs, etc. Uh, Protestant churches, it's not that they avoid it, but they don't consider it canonical. Uh, I've had some nice discussions with some Protestant ministers over, over the years uh, about these books, uh, and they're all familiar with them. They all studied them in, in uh, you know, when they went to seminary or theological school or, or um, divinity school or whatever. Um, and, and Sirach is, is liked quite a bit by, uh, by, by the, our Protestant friends, but they don't uh, consider it necessarily inspired scripture, inspired by God and worthy to be placed in the Bible, but they do like it. Um, uh, things like uh, we don't have the gospel of James in ours either, but this is where we get stories such as who were Mary's parents, um, you know, Anne and, and Joachim. Uh, those names are not in our Bible, but we embrace those stories and it's part of our theology. Same thing for Protestants here. They, they do like Sirach, um, but it's just not included in the Bible. Um, for the first and only time in, in biblical teaching, a uh, recommendation for being treated by a physician is actually introduced, and which is a direct challenge against the traditional idea that illness and disease was seen as a penalty for sin. So it, it really was very cutting edge in, in its day. Um, 
The, the story goes like this. Sirach assumes a situation in which Ben Sirah, the experienced sage and teacher, is instructing a younger man who he refers to as my child, who wishes to become wise. Uh, this prospective sage is a male, someone who has financial resources and will become the head of a household. The younger man is being trained to become a scribe, someone not only able to read and write, but also prepared to exercise public leadership. Ben Sirach conducted a school in Jerusalem, perhaps near the temple for such young men. There he showed his students how to join the wisdom traditions of the ancient Near East with their Jewish religious traditions. So it's a, a fascinating book, uh, very interesting. I'll give you some, some wonderful lines from it. Um, the first one is, is uh, I, I, I just love this, this note. Um, the opening lines, if any of you are old enough to remember 1982, uh, the Academy Award that year went to the movie Chariots of Fire. And the opening line of that movie is from Sirach. And it says, let us now praise famous men and our fathers that begat us. And it's not only from Sirach, but it's from the King James Version of Sirach. So again, that left us in the 1600s. So we, the Sirach fell out of the King James Version back in the 1600s, but that line was resurrected for the movie Chariots of Fire. Um, the first line of Sirach, all wisdom is from the Lord and remains with him forever. Um, so there's, a, there's some great quotes in Sirach. We get some great um, uh, scriptural readings uh, in, a, uh, in the church. Uh, and so the next time you hear, you know, a reading from the book of Sirach, you know, pay attention. There's some, there's some good, good wisdom in there. The next book uh, that we'll look at is, is wisdom. Um, and it's such an easy word. You know, a lot of people don't realize that it's not in all the Bibles. It's only in the, in the Catholic Bibles. The, the book is addressed to the rulers of the earth, urging them to love righteousness and seek wisdom. The wicked think that all is chance and that they should enjoy each day, but they are deluded. Considered wisdom literature, like, like the others, like Sirach, um, there are three main parts of this book. The first one of the first five chapters uh, is all about righteousness and immorality. I'm, I'm not going to bore you with, with a lot of the gory details here. We're just going to hit and run on this. Stay with me. Um, we're going to talk about, with, or it, it, does, it talks about wisdom, chapters six to nine, and wisdom's role in the early history of Israel, which is the second half of the book, um, chapters 10 to 19. The, uh, the language and style indicate that all three parts were written by the same author, and, and people can figure this sort of thing out by the word choices and things like that. But they don't think that they were written at the same time. It's, uh, so whoever wrote this um, probably wrote it in three different parts over three different time periods, and it all ended up together at some point. Teachings about the power and justice of God, the human condition, the nature of wisdom, the folly of idolatry and God's action in history are some of the, uh, the, the great topics that are tackled. A um, couple of great lines. Um, By the envy of the devil, death entered the world, and they who were allied with him experience it. I love that line. <laughs> great wisdom right there. They who are allied with him experience it. <laughs> The souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment shall touch them. Um, keep in mind, this was Jesus probably read this. You know, the, the, these are books that were well read in, at that time period. So um, some of these things might sound, wow, that sounds like something Jesus would say. Well, yeah, he read the book, you know. So um, it was just a printer that got rid of it. Um, the book of Tobit. This is a fun book. This, this has lots of mystery and cool things happening in it. The book is known for the purity of marriage. So it's a, it's a big marriage. It's all about marriage. You've, you've got uh, um, you know, a, a couple of people that, that fall in love and get married, et cetera. And there, there's all sorts of um, stuff going on here. Doctrinally, the book is cited for its teaching on the intercession of angels, namely Raphael. 
we all know that there's an angel Raphael, but the Protestants go, where in the Bible is Raphael? Oh, that's right. He's in Tobit. <laughs> he didn't make it to your Bible. You cut him out. Um, closely related to uh, Jewish wisdom literature, but it has a storyline to it. So the plot of the story begins with the tribulations of two righteous persons, Tobit and Sarah. So the first three chapters, you get that. Their stories kind of come together through the journeys of Tobias and Raphael, and which issues in this wedding of Sarah and Tobias. So the, this little love story forms in this wedding. This is where the Jews kind of had a little bit of a problem with the way that the, the wedding thing was set up. Um, and then Tobit gets healed from his blindness. And then the story ends with Raphael kind of revealing that mm, he's an angel. Um, so Tobit's him and his last testament are, are you know, right in that last section as well. So central to the plot is the motif of a quest, uh, this journey to a far country in search of Tobit's money, a bride for Tobias, the healing of both Sarah and Tobit, and the return home. Well worth the read, my friends. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great book and has a, a lot of good stuff. Here's a couple of lines that I particularly like. Um, now, my children, I give you this command, serve God sincerely and do what is pleasing in his sight. Um, see, that belongs in the Bible. Uh, am I wrong? I, I just think it belongs in the Bible. Blessed be God, blessed be his great name and blessed be all his holy angels. May his great name be his great name be with us and blessed be all the angels throughout all the ages. Um, just some, some wonderful, wonderful um, lines in, in Tobit. Then first Maccabees comes along. This is, a, this is a narrative, primarily prose text, but it's interrupted with um, seven poetic sections, which imitate classical Hebrew poetry. These include four laments and three hymns of praise, uh, if you think, uh, if you know much about the Psalms, we have lament Psalms, we have uh, uh, Psalms of praise, we have Psalms of thanksgiving, you know, there's, there's lots of genres of this type of, of uh, Hebrew poetry uh, in, in the Psalms, and we have the same thing in, in Maccabees, but it's embedded in, a, in kind of a story, uh, if you will. The name Maccabee can be derived, from, it's an anaponym, actually, and um, and I, and I tried to, if Father Jack's on the call, he'll tell me tomorrow how to pronounce that uh, line in Hebrew. Um, but it, it means, who is like you from amongst the mighty, the Lord? Um, so it's, uh, and for Judaism, again, keep in mind, this didn't make the cut. The, the, the rabbis in Jamnia kind of cut this one out, but this is where the story of Hanukkah comes from. So again, it's, it's not a book that the, the uh, rabbis said, this has no place in our faith. It said it doesn't have a place as a canon in canonical scripture. So, but if it weren't for the book of 1 Maccabees, you know, there'd be no Hanukkah. So it, it is part of the, uh, this whole story. The book recounts the exploits of Judas Maccabeus and his brothers, Jonathan and Simon. Uh, the author wants to show how God used Judas and his brothers to remove the yoke of oppression and to explain how the Jewish high priesthood came to reside in this family. Judas and his brothers represent God's own destiny. And the book's perspective is illustrated when Joseph and Ariziah try to gain military glory, but suffer defeat because, quote, they did not listen to Judas and his brothers. They did not belong to the family of those men through whom deliverance was given to Israel. We're going to go on after this to 2 Maccabees. There is actually a 3rd Maccabees and a 4th Maccabees, uh, which the Catholic Church does not consider canonical, the 3rd and 4th, that is. Um, however, the, they are used by some groups, uh, and again, they have good stuff in them. There are a lot of these books that don't make it to our Bible aren't necessarily wrong or worthless. They have, a, some of them have a great deal of value. Uh, and, and so, and this is a great example of, you've got these wonderful Jewish stories that the rabbis don't include in their, in the Tanakh, which is their, uh, you know, their canon of scripture that goes with, includes the Torah and, and, and other books that they use. 
So uh, a couple of lines here, let us rise up now and fight for our lives for today is not like yesterday and the day before. The battle is before us. Behind us are the waters of the Jordan. On either side of us, marsh and thickets, there is no way of escape. Cry out now to heaven so that you may be delivered from the hand of our enemies. Um, yeah, it's a big, <laughs> a lot of fighting. <laughs> But, uh, but well worth reading and, and the story of, uh, of Hanukkah. And you can see the picture there, you know, the dreidel and all that good stuff. Second Maccabees. Now, this is a very important book to us Catholics. Very important. The Second, second uh, Maccabees demonstrates several points of Catholic doctrinal interpretation. And a lot of, you know, if you, if you get into, if you've ever been in or whoever will get into an argument with some Protestants where, you know, the, 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 for the Protestants, the Bible is, is really super, super important. It's very important to us, but it's super important to the Protestants because they kind of threw out this idea of sacred tradition, which we still have. Um, so, um, but so they have to rely on the Bible as being this absolute word of God. So a lot of times, if you try to do um, uh, apologetics, you know, with a with an evangelical or something, they're going to go, "Well, where in the Bible does it say that?" Typical line, and you know, the, there's something to be said for it. I, I like it when they do that. Um, but there are several things that Catholics believe in, and the answer, um, unfortunately, is it's in Second Maccabees, and you didn't put it in your Bible. Um, so. First one is prayer for the dead and sacrificial offerings, both to free the dead from sin. This idea of purgatory. So we as Catholics believe that, the, that you, you, you die and you either go to heaven, you go to hell, or you go to purgatory. Purgatory just means that you're going to go to heaven. Purgatory doesn't some days leave you in hell, by the way. Um, you're either going to hell or purgatory slash heaven, because you will move from purgatory to heaven, God willing. Um, so this idea of purgatory actually comes from Second Maccabees. Um, the merits of martyrs, you know, the, 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 we kind of take that for granted of, you know, that we said, oh, well, you know, the, the, these people died for Christ or, or you know, St. Stephen uh, was the first Christian martyr and, and all that stuff. But this idea of, be, uh, of martyrdom being a meritorious act um, comes from Second Maccabees. Um, also, intercession of the saints. Oh, you Catholics, you pray to saints. No, no. We ask saints to intercede for us to, to God. We don't pray to saints. We ask them for their intercession. We ask them for their prayers with God. Um, so this idea of intercession of the saints um, comes from Second Maccabees. The idea of resurrection from the dead. You know, uh, and, 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 nuts, and I don't want you to jump all the way to Jesus right now. Let's, let's pull it back just a little bit. Um, if you remember the story, um, um, Jesus talking to, was it Martha or Mary, um, uh, at the rising, raising of Lazarus, and um, says, do you, do you believe um, in, in life after death, or, you know, the, the raising from the dead. And she says, well, I believe that everyone will be raised from the dead at the end of time. Um, and this is, was a very Jewish uh, way of thinking. Um, where did it come from? Second Maccabees, which later the rabbis threw out. It's very interesting. But anyway, this idea of resurrection from the dead started there. Also, the last one, um, which is, you know, if you think back to my first presentation, if you were on it, uh, two weeks ago, um, the specific mention of cre creation ex nihilo, uh, which is out of nothing. So this idea of a big bang theory, if you will, um, is second Maccabees. It's in there, this idea that God created out of nothing. So, um, and, and these are all in, in this book. So if you really want to get excited about your Catholic faith, go read a Jewish book called second Maccabees. The main part of the book uh, narrates three attacks on the temple and its successful defense by God and the people of Israel under the leadership of Judas Maccabeus. The first attack takes place uh, under Seleucus, uh, Seleucus when Heliodorus tries to plunder the temple treasury. The second attack occurs under Antiochus 
uh, and results in the recapture of the temple and its rededication by Judas. And the third attack it happens under Antiochus's son and involves the defeat of his general as he tries to capture and kill Judas. So, you know, more murder and mayhem and, and things like that. But these other ideas that I, that I told you about are kind of discussed throughout this. Um, this idea of ex nihilo, uh, I beg you, child, to look at the heavens and the earth and see all that is in them. Then you will know that God did not make them out of existing things. In the same way, humankind came into existence. God creates out of nothing. So it's, um, the, the, these, are, these are some great, so the pray for the dead. He then took up a collection among his soldiers, amounting to 2,000 silver drachmas, which he sent to Jerusalem to provide for an ex expiratory sacrifice. In doing this, he acted in a very excellent and noble way, inasmuch as he had the resurrection in mind. For if he were not expecting the fallen to rise again, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. But if he did this, with a view to the splendid reward that awaits those who have gone to rest in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Thus he made atonement for the dead that they might be absolved from their sin. This is great stuff. Why did, why did somebody let this out of the Bible? This is, a, this is an awesome book. Uh, lots of good stuff. This is the one that, like, next to nobody is going to be familiar with, uh, Judith. Uh, the story involves uh, a woman named, well, Judith, who, which translated means Jewish woman, um, a daring and beautiful widow who is upset with her Jewish countrymen for not trusting God to deliver them from their foreign conquerors. She goes with her loyal maid to the, the camp of the enemy general, Holofernes, with whom she slowly ingratiates herself, promising him information on the Israelites. Gaining his trust, she is allowed access to his tent one night as he lies in a drunken stupor. She decapitates him and then takes his head back to her fearful countrymen. The Assyrians, having lost their leader, disperse and Israel is saved. Though she is courted by many, Judith remains unmarried the rest of her life. This sounds like some show that's on NBC at 10 o'clock at night to keep the kids away from it. Um, but um, I, until I researched this part, I didn't know anything about the book of Judith. <laughs> so it's just never talked about in church. It's, we have it missing. It's not that long, um, but you know, if, you're, if, if you really don't want to watch television, and, and, but you still are into decapitations or something, this might be the one to go to. Um, so some of the central theological questions, who is the Lord? Is it Nebuchadnezzar, you know, who's the big king in Babylon? Or this uh, Holofernes, uh, you know, what role does he play? Do we have a God in Israel, as, as Judith eventually uh, proves? Um, but how, how does the Lord work? Is it through gigantic armies of Nebuchadnezzar, or is it by the hand of a woman? Uh, and, and which is a, which is a great point. I, uh, and um, so uh, that's well worth, I suppose, the read just to understand that point. And then we get Baruch. Baruch in, the, in uh, the Catholic Church is actually used in the liturgy of Holy Saturday coming up. Now, this year is a COVID year, and I'm afraid some of the readings might get a little uh, shortened or abbreviated for the, uh, the, the Holy Saturday Easter Vigil. Uh, it's usually quite a few readings. Um, so you may or may not hear it uh, at, at uh, this Holy Saturday, but by all means, look it up. Uh, it is a, it's a common place where we use it. Baruch 6 is quoted in the Catechism of the Catholic Church as part of an exposition against idolatry, which is a, a big chunk of what this book is all about. Uh, Narrative framework introduces Baruch and the exile community in Babylon. So this is taking place right around the Babylonian exile. Uh, not written at that time, uh, clearly written much later, but reflecting back on it. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of written as a history book. Um, let me skip some of that and give you a couple of quotes. Jerusalem, take off your robe of mourning and misery. Put on forever the splendor of glory from God. Um, 
definitely a rich book full of great quotes. And, and I, I don't have time to go into, you know, some of the confusions about Baruch and who might have written it and where it may have come from and, and things like that. But it, it does have a fascinating potential history, if you will. Um, so I want to get on to the last two sections here, which are on the additions. Um, the, the additions to Esther the, uh, are these additional six chapters that are interspersed. They are actually Greek clarifications of the original Hebrew text. So the original Hebrew text of Esther was, was great, everybody liked it, but I guess some people felt that it needed to have a further explanation. So these somebody came along after the fact and added these verses. Um, uh, when I did my master's in theology, my thesis was actually on canonicity of certain lines of scripture. Now I focused on just the New Testament, um, but, um, but this was kind of in the back of my head, like, okay, we have a precedent here of somebody interjecting, so, so obviously interjecting that they use a completely different language to interject into it, um, these clarifications. And there, there are a handful of phrases. My, my thesis, I looked at three different ones and looked at whether or not they should or should not be included in the Bible. Uh, spoiler alert, two out of three, they deserve to be there, um, even though they were um, uh, written afterward. Um, so they follow all the criteria of canonicity. So the, uh, the contents of the additions include both the decree against the Jews as well as the decree in favor of the Jews. This part Martin Luther had quite a bit of problem with. Um, so this was on his, uh, on his radar screen, if you will. He was not a big fan of the book of Esther. Uh, he de definitely, uh, as I copied out of, uh, of source here, he vehemently disagreed with the Jewish theology of the additions uh, on this. So if you see uh, Esther and it's one of the additions, you're gonna see it as a, um, uh, an addition with a letter. So the, the, I told you we use one of these in the Catholic Church, so it'll show up as Esther C, because it's the C edition uh, on it, uh, which is where you know, it, it gives prayers of Mordecai and Esther in the midst of crisis. Um, but these are, these are all the explanations of the, of the Hebrew part. Um, so this is the line that we, we actually use. This is our one line from the, from the book. Um, from the editions, if you will. So you see at the bottom, it says Esther C, 12, 14, 16. My soul's beloved, here Queen Esther shows us how we ought to pray for deliverance. We are to acknowledge who you are, and we are to recognize that you alone have power to save us. Uh, the, the, very much in line with everything that we expect from a great book in the Bible. Um, but uh, there are obviously some challenges with uh, the fact that it's, it's very obviously was interjected into the book well after the original book of Esther was, was written. Um, uh, and then finally, the last th uh, three little interjections into Daniel, the, uh, the prayer of uh, Azariah and the song of the three holy children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, uh, great story when I was uh, very involved in my in my church back when I was in early high school, I want to say we I was in a thing called puppet prose where we I, some woman went out and bought Muppets, full size Muppets, um, which weren't that old at that time because this was the 70s. Uh, and um, we, we used to put on a musical called uh, It's Cool in the Furnace. And it was a story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Uh, and I, every time I read this, there's a big chunk of it in the breviary that I have to pray every day. Um, and I think of it all the time. Um, I went and found a recording of it's cool in the furnace. It's long out of print, but anyway, um, Susanna and the elders, um, uh, is a, is a detective story. So it's one of the earliest literary examples of a detective story, uh, according to this Christopher Booker guy, at least. Uh, in it, two men attempt to coerce a young woman into having sexual relations with them and through blackmail, but they are foiled under the questioning by Daniel. Uh, and Bell and the Dragon, um, Daniel's detective work reveals that a brass idol believed to miraculously consume sacrifices is in fact a front for a corrupt priesthood, which is stealing the offerings. 
I used to, you know, everyone, I worked in a Catholic school. I, I taught morality, morality and bioethics, but every once in a while, you have to fill in as a substitute somewhere else. And uh, I filled in in the scripture class, you know, teaching the younger kids. And I used to tell them, I said, you know, turn off the TV. You're going to get the same stuff in a Bible. <laughs> Some of the stories are wild. Um, you know, crack, crack open your Bible and you can see the same stuff. So anyway, um, thank you so much. I'm going to turn off the sharing. I just want to give a plug for next week. Next week, we're going to go back to the topic of faith. And I'm going to go into something I'm calling Form Matters, um, which is a play on words. Uh, it's what makes a sacrament a sacrament. And uh, the two big things that make a sacrament a sacrament are what are its form and what are its matter. Um, so that's where the play on words comes from. But we're going to talk about everything that makes a sacrament a sacrament and how to understand that. So if you if you if you think there are some holes in your in your memory on that, um, please tune in. Um, I'll keep it simple. It won't be heavy, um, but it'll be fun. This will be fun. Um, so I hope this tonight wasn't too heavy uh, for for everybody. Um, let me get rid of my stop the share. There I am. And uh, so I hope you guys. Uh, oh, I see a thank you. You're most welcome. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I hope you found this interesting. I hope you found it interesting enough to go pick up one of these books and, and read it through. Uh, let me, let me see if, uh, somebody raised their hand and these one hand raised. Jack, did you have something you want to ask? Huh? Yeah. That's on mute. Talking permitted. You can talk, Jack. You oh yeah hi hi how are you good no I just hit the wrong button I just want to say thanks <laughs> oh you bet yeah that you're most welcome yeah I, that was great this is the first time I've ever answered a hand raise so that I'm, <laughs> I'm learning as I go here that's great so um, let me hit the chat and see if there's any uh, oh good I'm glad you guys enjoyed it I was this is the one I was most worried about because this is like really super churchy geeky stuff. <laughs> But most most of my subjects are going to be kind of geeky because, well, I'm a geek. So um, so uh, thank you so much. I, I hope uh, I hope you guys go pick up the Old Testament, uh, the Catholic version, um, N-A-B-R-E uh, um, or the N-R-S-V-C-E. Those are good uh, translations of the Bible. Uh, and you'll uh, you'll get these books and and hopefully get something really good out of them. Oh, oh, there we got a Q and A. This is wonderful. I've long wondered why our Bible was different than Protestants. Yeah, it was a printer. Oh my God, it was a printer. Oh, that just broke my heart the day I learned that. Um, yeah, it just goes to show you, you know, how people can really muck up the, uh, you know, everything. Yeah, where do you get the books not included? Um, well, they're in our they're in our Catholic books. Our, our Catholic Bible has those. If you want to, there are books that are not included in our Catholic books. If that's the one you meant, um, so you can get things like Edress. Uh, there's First Edress, Second Edress. Uh, there's uh, Third Maccabees, Fourth Maccabees. There's uh, there's a couple others that are used uh, by the uh, by the Orthodox um, that are not used by the Catholics. So um, that's a that's a that's a super advanced course on that one, and and I can't say I'm qualified <laughs> to talk about those. So, uh, but yes, God bless you all. Uh, the blessings of Almighty God, Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, and I will look forward to seeing you all next week. <laughs>